Hello and welcome to the fifth of the UKAA Fusion Tutorials. Uh, I'm Kate Taylor, uh, I'm a Graduate Development Engineer within the Engineering Realisation Group at UKAA and today I'll be talking about how a fusion power plant is going to work. So as we've seen in previous talks, you need a lot of very complicated science to make fusion happen. And to make a fusion power station, you need to address all of these challenges, plus some more. So I'm going to break this down into some key steps that we need to address to get fusion energy. Firstly, what fuel is a power station going to need and where are we going to get this from? Then our energy is in the form of heat. So how do we get this out of a burning plasma and make this useful? And finally, bringing all the pieces together, looking at how a fusion power plant will fit into the bigger picture and the challenges to bring one together. So all this research has been done into the very complex science of fusion to understand and control these processes. But how are we going to take that research to get energy onto the grid? Well, firstly, let's look at what a power station is actually going to need. It needs a fuel. We need a substance that can be burnt to produce energy. We then need to be able to ignite this fuel. Like a fire, we need to add some initial energy to start burning that fuel. That fuel will then react or burn. And during this process, it will produce energy in the form of heat. And once we've got heat coming out, the principles of making electricity are the same, whether it's for fission, for coal, for gas, or for fusion. Heat will heat up water, which will make steam. And the steam will then turn a turbine, which will power a generator and make electricity. Um, I mentioned before that for a fuel to be useful in a reaction, it needs to be burning. And similar to a fire that will remain hot and burning as long as we provide some fuel and some initial heat for fire, that's the spark, uh, it will keep on burning and we can keep getting heat out. And we want to do this for fusion. In fusion, this is called a burning plasma, where the heat inside the plasma is great enough that fusion keeps occurring without needing any more heat. This was touched on in talk three, and it means that we've heated the plasma to the point that no further heating is needed, and it's burning of its own accord as long as we're putting fuel in. But to achieve this, we need some fuel. So, for fusion, what do we use? So, as we saw in talk one, the sun uses hydrogen as its fusion fuel, but hydrogen needs quite extreme conditions to fuse, and combining two hydrogen atoms isn't actually that efficient to do, especially on Earth. So for fusion power on Earth, we will use deuterium and tritium as these fuse at the lowest temperatures, which makes our job a little bit easier as it needs less input energy. Um, but what are deuterium and tritium? Well, let's do a recap from talk one. Deuterium and tritium are the same element as hydrogen, but they are isotopes. But what is an isotope? Well, the nucleus is made up of protons, the red circle, and neutrons, the green circle. Well, the amount of protons inside the nucleus tells you what element you have and what chemical properties it's going to display. However, if you add extra neutrons, you're not going to change these properties, but you do make the nucleus heavier. And these are isotopes. So a proton and a neutron have the same atomic mass. The electron is very small, so we ignore it. Where we're going to call this one. So hydrogen has an atomic mass of one, deuterium will have an atomic mass of two, and tritium three. Um, but what are the practicalities of using these isotopes? Well, deuterium is simple. It naturally exists in seawater. And in the same way that hydrogen and oxygen make up a water molecule, if you replace that hydrogen with deuterium, you have deuterated water or heavy water. And in nature, about one in 6,000 molecules are actually heavy water, which means we can just extract it from seawater. And this is actually done commercially as heavy water is used as a coolant in fission power plants. And so this supply chain to get hold of this already exists. And water can then be broken down into its constituent elements. So the oxygen and the deuterium can be separated and the deuterium then extracted, which gives us the first half of our fuel. Tritium is a little bit harder. So tritium is a little bit harder. Uh, it's produced naturally by cosmic ray interactions within the atmosphere and can also be made as a byproduct of certain nuclear reactions. Tritium has a half-life of 12 years, which means it decays relatively quickly and so it doesn't exist within large quantities in nature. Uh, half-life is how long it takes for something that's radioactive to become half as radioactive as it was before. And 12 years is actually a very short period of time, which means that to get a hold of usable quantities, we need to rely on man-made production. The handling of tritium is also a challenge. Uh, I mentioned this radioactive. It's also toxic. If it gets inside the human body, it can cause great damage. And so handling it involves great care. At uh, UKAA, the heat facility, are actually undergoing world-leading research on how to handle and process this tritium, which will be a necessary skill required to run a power plant. 
These capabilities involve processing and waste handling, or detritiation, which is the removal of tritium from components and materials from within the reactor. The storage of tritium also comes with its own challenges. There are actually strict regulations on how much tritium is allowed in one location due to it being radioactive. This poses a limit on how much tritium can be stored, which means a fusion reactor can't have a permanent supply of fuel at hand. There can be enough tritium to start a reaction, but we need to be able to sustain it. And for a burning reaction, we require that constant refueling, which for deuterium is simple, but for tritium, we can't simply put more in if we don't have it. The use of tritium has multiple implications on the design and the operation of a fusion power plant. And we need to find a way to get tritium if we can't rely on a supply that's just going to be there. So if we come back to the fusion reaction, where we combine that deuterium and tritium out to get out a helium and a neutron, the helium will remain trapped inside the magnetic field as it's getting super hot. And so it's going to be stripped of that electron and will have a charge. And so it's affected by the magnetic field. Um, we discussed how the helium can transfer its energy to the plasma and helps to keep itself burning. But the helium only has 20% of the reaction's output energy, and that neutron will carry 80% of it. But what is a neutron? Well, a neutron is a subatomic particle with the same mass as a proton. But unlike a proton, it has no charge. And we saw how charged particles act in fields which means the neutron is very hard to control as it's not going to be affected by those magnetic fields. However, for fusion, this is actually useful as it means the neutron isn't trapped within the plasma and can travel out of the magnetically confined plasma and carry away its energy. And this neutron from fusion has got a lot of energy. It's about 80% of the reaction, which is kind of equivalent to what's known as 14 mega electron volts of energy. Um, and in sort of temperature terms, if you put a thermometer on that neutron, uh, it would be about 10 billion degrees, which is a lot, but it's going very fast. So how do we stop it? Well, we can actually use this neutron to make tritium. We can capture a neutron in an atom of lithium. If you collide a neutron with an atom of lithium, it undergoes fission and breaks apart into a helium atom and a tritium atom and some energy, which means we're not losing the neutron and we're getting tritium. Um, the lithium will be contained in what's called a breeder blanket, where the purpose of these is to breed more tritium as a fuel by capturing those fast neutrons before it can pass away and lose all its energy. Uh, the breeder blanket will surround the vacuum vessel, sort of like a blanket, where you can see here, this is kind of what a breeder blanket would look like. The tritium is then extracted from the blanket and fed back into that reaction, which solves the challenge of us not being able to store the tritium, as we're now making our own by keeping the reaction self-sustaining. And by doing this, we don't need that continuous supply of tritium. We just need enough to start the reaction and the lithium is going to give us the rest. Um, lithium is actually quite an abundant material and is used in batteries. And you can actually recycle old batteries to extract this lithium. So we've identified our fusion fuels and how we get them and how we can use them to sustain a reaction. But how do we get heat out of all of this? So we saw before that a power plant uses heat from burning fuel to make steam and fusion is going to be no different. And so I talked about the fuel we're going to use, but how do we get the heat out of the plasma when the plasma is confined by the magnets? Uh, we require that controlled extraction of this heat because fusion plasmas are insanely hot and we want to get that heat out, but we also don't want to disrupt that plasma from that magnetic confinement. So how can we do this? Well, as I mentioned before, those neutrons carry 80% of the energy from the fusion reaction of deuterium and tritium, and they don't stay in the plasma. So capturing the neutrons isn't useful in just making more tritium. It also means that we're not losing that energy. And the collision with neutron with that lithium produces energy as heat, which remains inside the breeder blankets as heat, which means the blankets are going to get very hot. And we can get this heat out as energy. So how do you get heat from a material? Well, if you pass a colder fluid through a hot blanket, that heat is then passed on to the cold liquid, which takes the heat away. That, the heat isn't destroyed, it's simply transferred. And as the material gets colder, the liquid gets hotter, and it then travels out and away from the reaction, which can then be used to heat water to make steam. And it's this steam that we want. And once we have that steam produced, we can use it to turn a turbine, which can power a generator and make electricity. And you can see here how it would all fit together. We've got the coolant loop passing through the blanket here into the steam generation, which would then go on to turn the turbine to power the generator to put energy on the grid. And this surrounds here the plasma. You can also see that there's the tritium extraction 
as it's taken from the blanket and back through and into the plasma. So there's, there's a lot going on here. But once we've got that heat out, making power is the same process as for any other power plant. It's easy, right? Well, there's still some other parts to consider. Something that's always been a challenge for fusion is getting more power out than we put in. Uh, JET currently holds the world record for this, and whilst a future reactor will be able to make fusion power of a greater amount, turning that into electrical power isn't always that efficient. Fusion power out is in the form of heat, and turning heat into electricity isn't the most efficient process. Some will be lost, which means that all parts of fusion energy are valuable. And we need to balance that input and that output, where our output is what we get as electricity. And whereas for JET, we take the input energy from the grid, for a power plant, we need to take that input energy from our output. So we need to ensure that our output is bigger than what our inputs are. We require inputs for heating the plasma, uh, the fuel. We saw how the fuel of the tritium needs to be pumped around and to keep the magnets cold. And to keep that input as low as possible, we need to carefully manage our power use. Part of this is a little bit easier because most of the energy required for the heating is actually needed in the starter. And once that plasma is burning, we don't need that energy. So ideally we'd want a plasma to be burning for as long as possible and would never stop. But sort of in practicality that's not possible because we do need to maintain and repair a device. And so we need to carefully balance how our operations are going to work in the design and to ensure that our input is going to be small enough that we're still getting enough output. Even once that heat energy is converted to electricity, we still have a usable amount we can put onto the grid. As we've seen in previous talks, Fusion uses some insanely complex science and engineering to support and combine the different areas needed not only to make Fusion happen, but to control and maintain a device. Um, you can see here, this is a picture of JET, uh, the current largest tokamak. Um, and JET has an enormous amount going on around it. And we're not even getting energy from JET. To do that, we need to get even bigger, uh, which is what ITER will do. ITER is being built in the south of France, um, and will basically be a scaled up version of JET. But it's still going to be an experimental reactor and isn't actually going to put energy on the grid. But it is going to be probably the most complicated device that humans have ever built, more so than the International Space Station or the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. And it is not even a power station. So we've got quite a task, really. Um, but once the complexities of fusion itself are addressed, then the production of electricity is going to be the same as what we've been doing for decades. And to achieve this working power plant, we're going to need to combine some, all this science and technology we've seen in previous talks into one machine. In the first talk, we saw and understood just how intense the conditions needed for fusion are and how difficult it is to create a plasma on Earth. We need to reach those three factors, that high temperature, that high density, and that long confinement time. And we use deuterium and tritium to get that fuel density. We'll use magnets to confine and to shape that plasma. And we use many heating methods to get the plasma up to fusion temperatures. And this is just to get a fusion plasma. To get a useful plasma that's making energy, we need to address even more challenges. So once we have a plasma burning, we need to be able to maintain this device from within. The conditions we need for fusion add an extra layer of complexity, as those neutrons produced, whilst they're useful, are also quite annoying and can damage and activate materials. And for a power station, we need materials, we need materials that can survive these conditions. Work is being done to research and develop these, and at UKAA we have the Materials Research Facility where work is being done to look at this. But inside the vessel will still contain too much radiation for humans to access, and so we will need to be able to handle these components remotely. This poses a challenge as it means that everything will need to be designed to be easily accessed and maintained in that remote way. Grace, the UKAA remote handling facility, are looking at developing the means to achieve remote handling in these extreme environments. But we also use tritium, which, whilst we can breed our own, once that plasma is burning, we still must understand how to handle it and what challenges it can pose. And here at UK again, we, are, we have world-leading tritium experts at Key who aim to develop this expertise. So why go to all this effort? Well, we need energy for most things in our day-to-day -day lives. Almost everything requires some form of energy, from entertainment to manufacture to transportation, and this demand is only going to increase as the populations increase. And whilst we're dealing with this increase in, in demand, we need to be reducing our CO2 emissions. This is a prediction of power consumption and the energy mix that we considered. And you can see that most of the energy mix currently is from fossil fuels, which put out huge CO2 emissions. 
And so we need something to change up this mix. And as we move away from fossil fuels, we need the alternatives. Fusion isn't going to be a near-term solution, nor will it be a standalone solution. It will fit together in a puzzle of different energy sources to provide that long-term sustainable energy. But if we consider all the energy sources alone, they have limitations. Wind and solar are limited by how good batteries are, which are expensive, because the sun isn't always going to be shining and the wind isn't always going to be blowing. So we need a way to store that energy. So we're dependent on battery technology. Uh, fission also has long-lived waste, and we have to be able to dispose of this waste and keep it safe. And so fusion isn't going to be perfect. It will cost money and emissions to construct a reactor. But once it is built, it will provide ongoing and a reliable energy source. And compared to others, it has so many advantages. It's inherently safe, and once constructed, will have no CO2 emissions. Now, as I mentioned before, the fuel is abundant. With one bathtub of water and two lithium batteries, you'll be able to provide enough fusion energy for one person for 60 years. So fusion will be an essential part of a future of greater energy demands and will provide us with significantly less downsides compared to some other fuels. But fusion is hard, but work is being done to design and research what reactors of the future are gonna look like, where this image shows maybe what a reactor could potentially look like in the future. Uh, I mentioned before that ITER won't produce power, but a reactor called DEMO will be the follow-on for ITER, and will use the research that was done for ITER to guide and design this technology. Uh, DEMO will be a European device, and here at UKAA and within the UK, we have our own project called STEP, which aims to design a fusion power plant that will be viable and put energy on the grid. Uh, STEP is different to that of DEMO in its design in that it will be a spherical tokamak as opposed to a more toroidal donor, uh, tokamak or donor. Um, but they both have the same goal, to produce electricity. And each of these programs will have to take all the current understanding we have of fusion and tackle those challenges to make a fusion power plant. But some incredible work is being done to realise this and to deliver fusion power. So, in conclusion, we identified what fuels we need for fusion and where they come from. These are deuterium, which come from seawater, and tritium, which we breed from the lithium. And we use that reaction with lithium to capture the neutrons to make heat, which is taken away to produce electrical power. Uh, we then consider the challenges that fusion faces and how a power plant will need to integrate or bring together a lot of very complicated technology to deliver fusion power. But a lot of work has been done to address this and to realise fusion as an energy source. So in the next talk, uh, we will look at other fusion technologies. And if you're interested, if you want to find out more, then you can visit us on the web at ccfe.ukaa or at eurofusion.org, or you can email our comms team here at UKAA, or you can follow us on social media. Thank you for listening.